My guest tonight is Dr. Badara Malafia, who was a presidential candidate in the last general election in Nigeria, as well as a, as well as a former central bank deputy governor. He has been in the news in recent times because of his fight against the continued killing in northern Nigeria. Tonight on Chip Stock Africa. But before we do that, please like this video and leave a comment below. Let's know what you think. And don't forget to subscribe and click on the bell button and share this video with somebody else. From Cape Town to Cairo and from Mogadishu to Dakar, this is Chim's Talk Africa. Hi there and welcome to this episode of Chim Stock Africa. I'm your host, Chim Onyebilama. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Uh, before we go into my interview with Dr. Badaya Melafia, uh, I'd like us to go to our segment on teaching. And Dr. Conrad Oranya will be bringing us the teaching this week. Uh, Dr. Conrad Oranya is coming in from Lagos in our segment called Teaching Time. Over to you, Dr. Conrad Oranya. Thank you, Brother Chim, again for the chance to be on Chim's Talk. Today, I'll be reading from Mark chapter 1, verse 9 to 11. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Today I'd like to look at when heaven opens. It did not say that heaven opened because Jesus had been praying and fasting for heaven to open. It did not say that Jesus went to God and asked for heaven to open, or he went to John and asked John to pray for heaven to open. It says it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee to be baptized by John in the Jordan, and immediately coming out of the water, the heaven opened. It seems to me that there is a direct correlation between Jesus coming to John to be baptized and the heaven opening. It seems to me that there are some small things that we need to fulfill if we fulfill those requirements without much prayer, without much fasting, the heavens will open. In this case, Jesus came to be baptized. Jesus did not need to be baptized, but he came to be baptized. And immediately after baptism, the heavens opened and the Lord spoke, and we know all that happened. What is it that could be the requirement needed for you to receive open heavens? It could be peace with your wife or your husband. It could be integrity in your place of work. It could be faithfulness and stewardship in the resources God gives you. We may be praying and asking for God to come down in power, for the voice of God to visit us. We may be praying and fasting for a divine visitation, but God says there is something I've been asking you to do you have not done it yet. If you only fulfill what I'm asking you to do, you don't need to pray and fast. The heavens will open. The heavens will open. Jesus came and he fulfilled a simple requirement. Not even a requirement he had to fulfill. As the Son of God, 
but he fulfilled that requirement. And only after that, the heavens opened, the voice came from above, this is my beloved son. Do you want God to introduce you to your world? Do you want God to speak and endorse you? Do you want a divine visitation and encounter? I have learned that while prayer and fasting is important, obeying God in little things is more important. Those little things the Lord has been speaking to you about again and again, this is the time to take it seriously. As you and I focus on obedience, we'll be surprised how quickly the heaven opens. When the heaven opens, everything else falls into place. When the heavens open, the endorsement from heaven comes. When the heavens open, the power of God comes. When the heaven opens, we'll hear the voice of the Holy Spirit clearly. But we need to fulfill that requirement. He's asking that requirement. He's calling on you. That requirement you need to fulfill. Lord, we need the heavens to open. Desperately, we need the heavens to open. We need the visitation of the Most High. We need the, the heavenly endorsement. We need the voice from above. But Lord, teach us to obey. Help us to listen and obey. Those things we keep putting away, these become the things that keep the heavens closed. May the heavens stay open, O oh God, as we obey you. Teach us to obey. Teach us to obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. C. Now, if the teaching has been meaningful to you and you have questions or comments about what Dr. Conrad has just taught, feel free to use the contact on your screen to contact us. I would love to answer your questions or hear your comments. And I would love to send you our free e books that would help you in your work with Jesus. Uh, do write us or email us or WhatsApp us through the contact on your screen. Now, let's go to my interview with uh, Dr. Obadiah, who is joining us via Zoom. Dr. Obadiah Melafia is a Nigerian development economist, an international polybat, and a former Central Bank of Nigeria deputy governor. And he's a, he's a statesman who, in 2019, in the Nigerian presidential elections, uh, contested as a candidate. Uh, his clip recently, uh, in a radio interview he gave, a video which came out of that radio interview, where he made claims about the complicity of uh, political leaders in Nigeria and some of the uh, continual killing in northern Nigeria had gone viral. And this has made him come in center stage of many of the issues concerning security in Nigeria. Dr. Melafia now will be joining me uh, via Zoom from uh, his abode in Nigeria. and. Uh, Dr. Melafia, you're welcome to the show. Thank you so very much, Brother Chin. Uh, thank you for having me. It's an honor and privilege to be on your show. And my blessings to all our viewers. Tell me, Dr. Melafia, were you surprised? I know that the issue of the killings in northern Nigeria has been in the news, but were you surprised at how viral that video of yours, which was put out, has gone across the world, literally? How, were you surprised? Uh, to be very honest with you, yes, I was. Um, but looking back, I, I wonder why I was surprised. Uh, I, I should have seen it coming. The thing is, it was a local FM station in Badagri, in the outskirts of Lagos. They had phoned in uh, for an interview. So, well, uh, it was around... Uh, 7.30 in the morning and uh, I was zipping my coffee 
and having what I thought was just a chat, a radio chat, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, because, but it was Zoom, so they they, they, they were taking, um, of course, the, the video as well. And uh, we had what I thought was an honest conversation. And uh, the thing just went nuclear, basically, across the whole country. And the rest of the country is beyond the country. Absolutely beyond the country. Absolutely beyond beyond around the world. In, around the world, absolutely. You know, that is really what happened. So here we are. Personally, I, I, I personally I feel you were doing what every Christian should be doing, speaking out as a voice against evil. And uh, uh, in your view, what do you think is the duty of a Christian in the face of evil? I think the duty of the Christian is to take a stand. And I, de I derive my inspiration uh, from great Christians of the past who took a public stand against evil. Now, uh, uh, it, it was clear from that video that uh, your passion to speak against injustice and speak out for those who have no voice, uh, it was so clear from that. But tell me, was this the reason, this Christian duty to speak out and fight for uh, the oppressed, was this the reason you contested in the last uh, presidential election in Nigeria? Well, um, I would not be totally honest if I told you that I was running as a Christian and I was driven by Christian principles to make a difference. Uh, the real uh, motivation was not as noble as that, if I'm to be just transparently honest. I was living abroad in, in, in Belgium, in France, in, in Brussels, in Belgium. I was chief of staff of the ACP group. I was an international civil servant. I was having a wonderful time. I came on holiday and I met a very terrible situation. My cousin and her two daughters, little daughters, had been attacked by the Fulani militias. The husband managed to escape, but you know, they, they you know, you know, shot them to death and cut them to pieces the way you cut someone. Now, her father had died just a few months earlier. So when I went to console the mother, she just held me and, and passed out, literally collapsed, and uh, went into some sort of coma. She had to be carried away uh, to seek medical help. I can tell you, Chim, there and then, something snapped in me. I told myself and I promised myself that I shall come back, I shall fight this evil, and I will defeat it. God helping me. I didn't care whether I spent all my money or my little savings, whatever, I was ready to fight this evil. That was the motivation. Uh, you could also wow. say that it was a form of righteous anger and that I was being guided by the Lord. Uh, but I can tell you the, the prime motivation was something more, huma more human and more immediate. Uh, Personally, the, Dr. Badaya, I feel that it ties in with the Christian call, even though you had that personal uh, experience in your family, but that... Uh, your, your, your motivation ties in very well with the Christian call. Now, tell me, Dr. Obadiah, what would have thought that uh, with the killings in Nigeria and the insecurity being perpetrated by the Boko Haram Muslim extremists and the Fulani headsmen, that when the present president got into office, that we should have seen it uh, scaling down and becoming less and less, one would have expected that they would say, well, our man is now in office, so we're not going to make any trouble, there will be no insecurity so that they will have peace. How do you explain the fact that in recent times, the, the whole insecurity and killings and, and all of this terrorism has just increased the more in Nigeria? How do you explain it, Dr. Badaya? Well, um, there are a few facts that most people don't know. The first one is that the current incumbent of the High Magistracy of the Nigerian Federal Republic 
uh, is also the spiritual head and political head of all the Fulanis of the whole world. It's an organization called Neyeti Allah. He is the head of Neyeti Allah worldwide and has been before he entered politics. So he had the status of a caliph among his, his people. And uh, I get the impression that uh, once he was in power, they felt that this was now the opportunity for them to complete the jihad of 1804 that had been started by their phobia, uh, you know, um, Sheikh Uthman ibn Fudil uh, in the early 19th century. Uh, he started a conflagration in the, nine, in the name of an Islamic jihad that conquered the whole of the north. It was known as the Western Sudan. Uh, and the only people he couldn't conquer were the Middle Belt, who were mostly pagans. Uh, until, by the way, uh, a German uh, missionary by the name of Karl Kuhn felt the call of God to go and evangelize what was known as the Western Sudan. When, when you look at the killings in northern Nigeria, or would you say that the Christians and the churches bear the big brunt of this, that they're the main target of this uh, uh, killings and uh, adoptions and all of that? What would you say? Yes, I do. Uh, but let's be very fair. As many Muslims probably as Christians have borne the, the brunt of this. Uh, but in that of the Muslims, it is more like collateral damage, more like people who uh, disagree with the, the, the fascists, the, the, the terrorists, and therefore they have to settle scores with them. Uh, and then they just, uh, there's also an ethnic dimension. The Fulanis despise the Hausas, even though all of them are Muslims. And so sometimes they feel no qualms in attacking and killing Hausa Muslims. Uh, but they reserve the signature approach of atrocities to Christians, especially beheading. Over 400 clergy, uh, and including Roman Catholic uh, priests and um, um, Christian Protestant pastors have been killed by the terrorists in northeastern Nigeria. Over 3,000 churches have been destroyed. So you wouldn't say that they would attach, you know, so definitely there's a target here. Tell me, how is the Nigerian church responding to this heightened insecurity that is right now even affecting the southern part of Nigeria increasingly? Well, I, I don't like to be very critical of, of our elders, the leaders of the churches in Nigeria. But I am afraid uh, that... It is like the kind of church that uh, uh, John, the Apostle John, you know, prophesied in the book of Revelations. It is like the church of Laodicea. The church in, of Laodicea is never called no hot. And so God has to spew it out because it is a tasteless church. I'm afraid this is really where we are with regard to the church. Uh, I haven't seen enough. If the church had taken a full stand, I think these atrocities would have been limited. I would have seen, I would have loved to see a situation where the whole church stand up and say no, including ordering all the churches all the Christians in Nigeria to stay at home for a week. Don't go to work. Don't uh, come out of your house. Sit at home and fast in protest against what is happening. If we could do that, I think that you know, uh, uh, you, you know, more would have been done to stop 
the evils that is going on. So I worry that the church has not done enough. Dr. Melafia, what would you propose as a solution for this, all these killings in Nigeria? Um, I think the first thing would be for the government to come out and address the nation and to allow the nerves to cool down uh, and to restore confidence and, uh, you know, bold action needs to be taken to disarm the terrorists, uh, to restore hope uh, to communities that are in despair. Uh, but if they cannot do that, uh, I have always said that local communities have a right uh, to defend themselves if the government is unable and or unwilling to come to their defense. It is their right under our constitution, under our laws, under international law, and under the precepts of natural justice and equity and even universal global ethics. Uh, it, it prescribed that communities that face an existential threat to their very survival have a moral duty to take such steps as are necessary to defend uh, their communities. So the right to self-defense must be affirmed. And uh, we can't always wait for government to do it. There's nothing in the scriptures that says that if a man comes with guns and bayonets uh, to your home, you should lie down and just be nice to him and allow him to eliminate members of your family. There is nothing in the Bible that says we should do that. Therefore, I, I, I stand by the right of people to defend themselves if the government seems unwilling or unable to defend themselves. Uh, we need a national dialogue. The country needs to be restructured because it seems clear to us that the current structure and the current constitution, which by the way, was actually designed by Fulanis and Muslims. You know, Christians really have no, no say in it. The military sat down, did it, and just you know, lumbered it on the people. And we have to just take it or leave it. And um, when you had good leaders who were fair, fair-minded and just, those issues never came to the surface. But now that we have a leader who seems to be tacitly in collusion uh, with the Islamists, then we have reason to insist that this bad constitution must be thrown away. And, you know, all the people of Nigeria need to send their representatives to um, design a new constitution where power is devolved to the regions and where government is truly based on the will of the people and on the rule of law, justice, and, and equity. Dr. Obadiah, I want you to speak to our viewers who are watching in other parts of Africa and beyond, as that woman watching from Nairobi, that man watching from Cape Town, what can such individuals do to help? You would have heard the story of uh, the founder of your, your missionary of the Capro ministry, uh, Uncle Bayo Famonure. Yeah. I used to live in Jos myself until recently when I had to resign from my job and leave. And within that period, when I was suffering persecution, he and his wife and family were praying in the evening when the Fulani Islamist terrorists went to their house and yeah. simply put fire on them. They, f they shot him on the forehead and by miracle of miracles, mm. The bullet hit him on the forehead and ricocheted as though his face had become steel. Yes. And Naomi, his wife, who had been kneeling down and praying, they simply came and emptied bullets into her spine. By miracle of miracles, it just missed her spine. Shot, they shot the other children. But miracle of miracles, all of them survived. Now, 
This is the reality of our country today. They aim for clergy, they aim for church people, they aim for Christians. What we are having today in Nigeria is an Islamic jihad. They are struggling to conquer our country and to take over our country. This is what is happening. This is really what is happening. And my, my appeal is that our brethren throughout Africa should remember Nigeria in their prayers, and they should act through their governments to, you know, raise issues with Nigeria and to force the agenda back at the forefront of the attention of the international community and uh, of the African Union and indeed all civilized humanity. Thank you so much, Dr. Melafia, for your passion for the, for the oppressed and your, your, your desire to bring about justice. Uh, the Lord will strengthen you, the Lord will help you, and the Lord will lead you to more and more effectiveness. Thank you so much for your time and for joining us uh, today. Great. So this is where we wrap up for this week. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, let me say once again, if this program has been a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to consider partnering with us. Your generous gift can make a huge difference because uh, it will help us to take the gospel to more and more people all across Africa. If uh, you would like to do this, we would like to send you a thank you gift. My latest book, God Gives, is Children, a song is a book that has blessed people all across the world. And I want to send a copy of this to you as a thank you for whatever gift you would uh, give into this ministry this uh, week to help us carry on, carry on this gospel work we continue to do across the continent as well as our various missionary work. Uh, go ahead and use the contacts on the screen if you'd like to know how to donate to our ministry today. Thank you so much for joining us. Remember there is a lot more content we have on our YouTube channel. Use the contacts on the screen and uh, get to watch our old editions and many more things on YouTube. Bye bye now. See you next week. Same station, same time. Bye. Please like this video and leave a comment below. Let's know what you think. And don't forget to subscribe and click on the bell button and share this video with somebody else.